on World News Tonight. Concluding talks. President Biden wraps up a global summit with many agreements made, paying extra attention to supply chain walls. Japan decides. Results on the Japanese election polls show a dangerously close lead between rival parties. Awaited reunions. Emotions run high as families see the return of their loved ones. Day of the Dead. Mexico parades painted skulls and colorful costumes paying homage to Halloween. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with a series of in-person meetings held with world leaders. With mounting problems over supply chains holding back the global economic recovery, U.S. President Joe Biden held a summit with his G20 counterparts in Rome. There, leaders agreed to cooperate to strengthen the system and get supply chains moving again. On his final night in Italy, President Biden made a prediction about his long-awaited domestic policy agenda. I believe we will pass my Build Back Better plan, and I believe we will pass uh, the infrastructure bill. But a dismal sign back home. A new NBC News poll finds the president's approval rating slipped to 42 percent, a seven-point slide since August. And 71 percent responding say America is headed in the wrong direction. The polls are going to go up and down and up and down. I ran to make sure that I followed through on what I said I would do. Addressing the supply chain crisis hitting consumers at home. Today, President Biden announced new steps to reduce red tape at ports and urged other governments to ease the flow of goods. Government can play a key role identifying supply chain risks. One piece of the president's domestic spending plan going global. The corporate minimum tax was endorsed by all G20 leaders to require multinational companies pay at least 15 percent tax. This is an incredible win for all our countries. In a separate breakthrough, the president announced an end to Trump-era import taxes on foreign aluminum and steel. In response, the European Union ending tariffs on American goods like bourbon and motorcycles. On stopping Iran's progress toward a nuclear weapon, the president said diplomacy can restore the Iran nuclear deal, while pointing blame at his predecessor, who took the U.S. out of that deal. I think we're continuing to suffer from the very bad judgments that President Trump made. After a summit about allies and close ties, the one world leader from this week's visit who affects him most deeply... Pope Francis. I just find my relationship with him one that I personally take great solace in. He is a really, truly, genuine, decent man. The United Nations COP26 summit that starts in Glasgow this week has been billed as last chance. But the close of the G20 with little more than vague promises highlighted the lack of political urgency so far. The UN COP26 climate summit opened on Sunday, billed as a make or break chance to save the planet. But as one summit began, another ended, the G20 in Rome, which highlighted doubts and anger over whether years of empty pledges would turn into political momentum. COP26's aim is to keep alive the target of capping global warming at 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels which scientists say is our only hope of avoiding catastrophe. As delegates began arriving in Glasgow, Scotland, COP26 President Alok Sharma said an August report by UN scientists was a wake-up call. It made clear that the lights are flashing red on the climate dashboard. That report, agreed by 195 governments, makes clear that human activity is unequivocally the cause of global warming. To the fury of protesters in Rome, G20 leaders urged meaningful and effective action on Sunday but offered few concrete commitments. Even though the bloc of the world's 20 richest nations is responsible for an estimated 80% of all global emissions. A new pledge last week from China, the world's biggest polluter, to reach net zero but not until 2060, 
was labelled a missed opportunity that will cast a shadow over the two-week summit. The return of the United States, the world's biggest economy, to UN climate talks will be a boon after a four-year absence under Donald Trump. But like many world leaders, President Joe Biden will arrive in Glasgow without firm legislation in place, as Congress wrangles over how to finance it. For any chance of success, COP26 needs to secure far more ambitious emissions pledges and lock in billions in climate finance for poorer countries. COP26. Pope Francis urged world leaders to listen to the cry of the earth and the poor. Britain and France clashed again in a post-Brexit fishing row, with London denying it had shifted its position and Paris insisting it was now up to Britain to resolve a dispute that could ultimately hurt trade. A meeting meant to solve a dispute seems to have caused a bigger rift. Emmanuel Macron and Boris Johnson held a one-on-one -on -one conversation on the sidelines of the G20 to try and find a solution to the ongoing fishing license crisis. The French president said he's made his views clear and it's up to the UK to take the next step. Si les Britanniques ne font aucun mouvement de manière évidente, les mesures qui sont prévues à partir du 2 novembre devront se mettre en place parce que ce sera une fin de non recevoir. La balle est dans le camp des Britanniques. It's the threat of French sanctions that has the UK seeing red. During the G20, Johnson complained to the EU Commission president that he wanted the threat of sanctions withdrawn before carrying out any negotiations. On fish, I've got to tell you the, the, the position is, is unchanged. I, I must say I was puzzled to read a, a letter from the French Prime Minister explicitly asking for Britain to be punished for leaving the EU. Johnson has called France's comments troubling, objecting to the tone of a letter sent by Jean Castex to Brussels calling on the bloc to demonstrate there is more damage to leaving the EU than remaining in it. France has accused the UK of not respecting its post-Brexit trade agreement in relation to granting fishing licenses to French boats. If the issue is not resolved, Paris has threatened to ban British boats from its ports and step up custom checks on products coming into France from Britain. The UK says it's up to Paris to de-escalate the situation and has threatened to activate a Brexit dispute tool over the matter. Downing Street has already summoned Paris's ambassador to London for the type of dressing down that's usually reserved for unfriendly states. The French president had made a claim that the Australian Prime Minister lied to him over the cancellation of a submarine building contract in September and indicated more was needed to be done to rebuild trust between the two allies. French President Emmanuel Macron said Australia's leader, Scott Morrison, lied to him over a cancelled submarine contract. It's the latest shot fired between the two countries, as both leaders were in Rome for the G20, meeting for the first time since Australia ditched the multi-billion dollar deal with France. Macron spoke to a group of Australian reporters on the sidelines of the summit. I have a lot of respect for your country. I have a lot of respect and a lot of friendship for your people. I just say when, you, when we have respect, you have to be two and you have to behave in line and consistently with this value. Do you think he lied to you? I don't think. I know. Australia formed a new security alliance with Britain and the US known as AUKUS in September. They then announced a new order for nuclear-powered submarines. Macron says AUKUS caught them off guard and later France recalled its ambassadors from Washington and Canberra. Speaking at the conference, Morrison then fired back at Macron. He said he had explained to Macron that the conventional submarines would no longer meet Australia's needs and that they were already rebuilding their ties. On Friday, US President Joe Biden said he had thought France had been informed of the contract cancellation before the AUKUS pact was announced but that the handling of the new agreement had been clumsy. Despite some forecasts, Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party might lose its sole majority in the country's general election. It actually performed much better than expected, with the party easily holding on to more than half the seats in the lower house. Other than a World News special correspondent, Rasida Chandradasa from Tokyo in Japan reports. Prime Minister Kishida Fumio and his ruling Liberal Democrats had a very big election night. 
uh, yesterday. Uh, election was held throughout Japan yesterday, and the polling booths, the polling stations, are closed by 8 p.m. and in Japan, you get the exit poll right after the pollings are closed. So by 8 p.m., we pretty much have 50% of the results. And by 12 midnight, uh, 90 to 95% of the results were out. And that results gave a clear mandate for the uh, Prime Minister Kishida Fumio. His ruling Liberal Democrat won 261 seats out of total 465 seats in the Japanese parliament, which is what we call Diet. You know, surprisingly, even the exit polls taken on the election date gave uh, Kishida Fumio and his party around 2,200 to 230 seats. And most thought the ruling Liberal Democrat would not be able to get the majority in the parliament. But eventually, they, they easily surprised the majority. And with their coalition partner, New Kometo, they, which also got about 30 to 32 seats, they have around 300 seats out of the 461 seats. So what this huge ruling party victory means for the opposition? Uh, the opposition leader, Edano Yukio, had a miserable night. His party was expected to do well and expected to win around 130 to 140 seats. But eventually, they won less than 100, which is lower than what they had in the previous parliament. So the surprising results, one of the biggest reason was the Kishida Fumio's party was able to pull out those narrow, close victories where they, some of the seats they were expected to lose, they actually won by a few hundred votes or a few thousand votes. And on the other hand, the opposition party, they, they, they lost seats that they were expected to win. So Kishida Fumio, who had a two to three weeks uh, tenure as, his, as a prime minister, now have a four year mandate to rule Japan. But he also have some uh, shocking results. Uh, Amari-san, his general secretary lost his seats. And this is the first ever time in the ruling party's history that a general secretary lost his or her uh, constituency. But he also will be able to go to the parliament due to the Japanese rules. They have also a representative uh, voting that even you lose the constitution, you can have a, a, some kind of a national list that we have in Sri Lanka. But Amarisan is expected to resign from his general secretary post and that would create some problem for the Kishida san because they had a very good working relationship and Amarisan was expected to support him for the next four years. So the parliament would commence in a few days or few weeks and the ruling liberal democrat, they have a super majority, they have a clear mandate to rule four more years. And the Kishida san policies every country including the US and obviously China is looking very closely. One of the reasons for that is Kishida san belongs to the liberal wing of the ruling liberal democrat. Unlike his predecessors Suga san and Abe Shinzo who actually belonged to the who are, who are very skeptic who are very China skeptic and they had a very what would say a distance relationship with China. So China is expecting to have a, a closer uh, relationship with Kishida san. And also, no doubt, Kishida-san's main priority would be the United States. So he has declared that he would make a visit and he would, he would meet the uh, U.S. Prime Minister Biden for a bilateral tour. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Many Afghans displaced in recent fighting have yet to receive aid as winter sets in. One group of women near Kabul said the cold, dire conditions have claimed the lives of several newborn babies. Displaced Afghan families called for help on Sunday, saying newborn babies are dying because of the winter cold. There have been warnings Afghanistan could face a catastrophic famine this winter, and humanitarian aid has begun to trickle in. But none of it has reached this group of displaced people. This woman gave her name as Halima. So far, around four to five babies were born here, and then they died due to the cold. Yesterday, an elderly man and a child who went on the streets to earn money for buying food had a car accident, and both died. We are in a very tough situation. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees has said about 50,000 Afghans from different provinces who were displaced by recent conflicts have moved to Kabul. 
Even before the Taliban's victory over the Western-backed government in Kabul two months ago, more than 18 million Afghans, or about half the population, needed humanitarian aid, according to the UNHCR. The freezing weather underlined the urgency in getting assistance to thousands of displaced. Many have fled from the provinces and are sleeping in tents or improvised accommodation around the city. Now on to the updates of the COVID pandemic. Australia eased its international border restrictions for the first time in the pandemic, allowing some of its vaccinated public to travel freely and many families to reunite, sparking emotion, emotional embraces at Sydney's airport. Other than a World News Special Correspondent, Timothy Phillip from Melbourne in Australia reports. After 18 months of some of the world's strictest coronavirus border policies that banned citizens unless granted an exemption from coming back into the country, Millions of Australians in Victoria, New South Wales and Canberra are now free to travel. International travellers arrived in Sydney via Singapore Airlines. There were tearful reunions at the airport as family and friends reunited for the first time, with strict travel rules previously prohibiting many people from attending significant events, including weddings and funerals. Most tourists, even vaccinated ones, have to wait to come to Australia although vaccinated tourists from New Zealand will be allowed in. Unvaccinated travellers will still face quarantine, restrictions and all travellers need proof of a negative COVID-19 test prior to boarding. The change in travel rules, however, is not uniform across Australia. As the country states and territories have differing vaccination rates and health policies. Australia closed its borders at the start of the pandemic but as it switched a COVID-0 pandemic management strategy towards living with the virus through extensive vaccinations, borders are gradually reopening. The FDNY is under pressure just hours before the city's vaccine mandate is enforced. Thousands of firefighters and other unvaccinated municipal workers could be on unpaid leave starting today, but some are protesting the mandate. Tonight, the nation's largest fire department under pressure. Just hours before New York City's vaccine mandate is enforced, thousands of firefighters and other unvaccinated municipal workers could be on unpaid leave starting Monday. But some members of the FDNY are protesting the mandate, calling in sick and disrupting essential services. One New York congresswoman tweeting, 26 FDNY companies are closed, including five in my district. Engine is open, but the ladder is closed. God forbid there is a major fire or a severe car accident or if a crime takes place or even worse. Today, FDNY's commissioner firing back. The department has not closed any firehouses, but he did confirm members were calling out sick, writing irresponsible bogus sick leave by some of our members is creating a danger for New Yorkers and their fellow firefighters. They need to return to work or risk the consequences of their actions. The mayor adding that there will be contingencies to address staffing issues morning, if they everyone. arise, while noting a 91% vaccination rate among city workers Saturday. For days, firefighter unions have expressed outrage over the mandate, asking for additional time to get the shot. My members have not given an op have been given a proper opportunity to be informed by the department of the city what's going to happen to them. The vaccine battle is brewing ahead of a critical week to clear COVID shots for more than 28 million 5 to 11 year olds. Many of them out in full force this Halloween with some families eager for an extra dose of protection. I'm definitely relieved that they can. Um, it's something that I hoped was going to happen sooner than later. Hospitals, including Star Med Healthcare in Charlotte, are ready for the rollout days before the CDC's final endorsement. We have some good news for you. Indonesian scientists have found a way to fight disease-bearing mosquitoes by breeding a species of the insects which carries a kind of bacteria that prevents viruses like dengue from growing inside them. <laughs> Researchers in Indonesia are fighting mosquito-borne diseases with more mosquitoes, but these are carrying a secret weapon. A joint study has been releasing lab-bred mosquitoes in the city of Yogyakarta, targeting red zones for dengue fever. But these bugs carry Wolbachia, a common bacteria found in over half of insect species that prevents viruses like dengue from growing inside them. It's not, however, found in Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, which often carry dengue, according to the nonprofit World Mosquito Program. 
WMP trial results showed this method reduced dengue cases by nearly 80 percent and hospitalizations by nearly 90 percent. Sri Purawangsi is a local in Jakarta and a research volunteer. All three of my children have been infected with dengue and hospitalized. It's always on my mind, thinking about how to keep my village healthy. Global dengue infections have risen rapidly in recent decades, according to the World Health Organization. About half of the world's population is now at risk, with an estimated 100 to 400 million infections reported every year. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki tested positive for COVID-19 and is experiencing mild symptoms. She is vaccinated and last saw President Joe Biden on Tuesday when they sat outside more than 1.8 meters apart and wore masks. A 24-year-old man dressed as the comic book character The Joker attacked passengers on a Tokyo train line, injuring 17 people as many partygoers headed into the city center for Halloween gatherings. A declassified U.S. intelligence report saying it was a plus bulb that the COVID-19 pandemic originated in the laboratory is unscientific and has no credibility, Chinese Foreign Minister spokesman Wang Wenbing said in a statement. And finally tonight, thousands of Mexicans crowded into the main avenue of Mexico City for a lively day of the Dead Parade, relishing the chance to mark the festive tradition after the coronavirus pandemic cast a thick pall over last year. Most of the mass of the spectators wore protective face masks as they watched colorful floats, bands and performers trundle down the street. Children sat atop their parents' shoulders to catch sight of the possession of floats bearing dancers in indigenous attire and feathered headdresses, scaled down reproductions of Mexico City landmarks and spectacle figures. The parade is a modern twist on a belief that dates back to the pre-Hispanic era, drawing on beliefs that the dead can return from the underworld to meet with their loved ones. Traditionally, families put up altars dedicated to loved ones who've passed, decorating altars with flowers and sweets so that the dead can find their way back home. Day of the Dead celebrations officially begin on November 1st with the Day of the Innocents to honor departed children. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. You can rewatch this program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Until then, I'm Suzanne Shinari and stay safe and have a good night.